1811, there was still plenty to do. The bloody war in Spain continued. Britain remained a stubborn enemy, and now a new war threatened. Tsar Alexander refused to be part of the continental blockade of British goods any longer. Napoleon's edict barring trade with Great Britain was ruining the Russian economy. Tensions quickly escalated. Every attempt to negotiate failed. In the spring of 1812, ignoring the advice of his closest advisors, Napoleon invaded Russia. Never in living memory had so large an army been assembled. Italians, Poles, Germans, French, more than 600,000 men from every corner of his empire. Napoleon prophesied that the war would be over in 20 days. An army of 600,000, it would seem to be absolutely irresistible, no matter what happened. He'll simply pour in enough men to overwhelm the Russians, force them into, uh, to engage in battle, and, and, and defeat them. Napoleon's army trudged slowly across Russia's immense spaces. He hoped to annihilate his enemy at once. But the Russians would not give battle. Napoleon had an army twice the size of the Russians. There were so many that the Russians didn't dare fight. They started to retreat because they didn't have a choice. They had to retreat. But while they were retreating, they were in fact weakening Napoleon's army. As the days passed, the blazing heat of the Russian summer began to take its toll. Soldiers fell out from exhaustion, sickness, and desertion. Thousands every day. After two months, before Napoleon had fought a single battle, 150,000 soldiers were out of action. A lot of these foreign troops just took off and left. One fourth of the army deserted. They weren't Frenchmen, they weren't loyal to him specifically. They were fighting because their king was allied to Napoleon. At last, with summer ending, the Russians turned and faced their enemy at the crossroads village of Borodino. Moscow, the holy city of Russia, was at stake. As the soldiers of the Tsar prepared themselves for battle, they chanted, "'Tis the will of God, tis the will of God." They were prepared to die, to die for Russia. Everyone saw this as a holy day, that they were going to die for a great purpose. There was a tradition to put on clean underwear before dying. They all put on clean white underwear and went into battle. The Battle of Borodino was a brutal slugfest. Napoleon threw his enormous army at the Russians in a frontal assault, showing little of his old strategic subtlety. This was a wild attack. They were killing each other. There were deaths without stop. It was horrific. The battle began at 6.30 in the morning and lasted until 3 in the afternoon. At that point, both armies were exhausted. The Russians fought the emperor's armies to a standstill. The next day, they withdrew, leaving Napoleon proclaiming victory. Moscow was at his mercy but the Russians refused to make peace. As Napoleon's army entered the city, he found it almost deserted. That night, Moscow began to burn. Mountains of red, rolling flames, Napoleon recalled later, like immense waves of the sea. Oh, it was the most grand, the most sublime, and the most terrifying sight the world ever beheld. 
Русские сами подожгли Москву. И вот когда Москва загорелась, И Наполеон не мог оставаться в Москве. Наполеон Fearing the approach of winter, but reluctant to abandon his conquest, Napoleon wrote the Tsar proposing negotiations. The Tsar responded with icy silence. After five weeks of waiting, Napoleon bitterly ordered his soldiers home. On October 19th, he led his men, laden with spoils, out of Moscow through the gate of Kaluga. It was a warm fall day. Three weeks later, it began to snow. The Russian winter had arrived early. Temperatures fell to 22 degrees below zero. Napoleon's soldiers froze in the open countryside. Our lips stuck together, one soldier wrote. Our nostrils froze. We seemed to be marching in a world of ice. You can't imagine the suffering of the Russian retreat. When they spoke, their breath froze with a little dry sound. Their words were freezing in the air. Food ran out. Horses died by the thousands. Hungry soldiers quarreled over the horse flesh. They were fighting starvation, cold, fatigue, disease, and the Cossacks. The Cossacks harried Napoleon's flanks, tearing at his army as if it were a wounded animal. The army is being eaten away because it is being attacked on all sides. So the army fell apart little by little. The French army no longer existed as a fighting force. Napoleon watched as his army died. Fearing capture, he carried in a little black leather bag tied around his neck a vial of poison. Six months before, he had crossed into Russia with more than half a million soldiers, confident of victory. Now, on December 5th, rumors of a coup in Paris forced him to abandon his troops and head back to the French capital. As his sled made its way across Europe, he told a companion, it's just one step between the sublime and the ridiculous. He lost half a million men, the staggering sum. Out of the 600,000 men who went in, 93,000 came back. It was the beginning of the end, his former foreign minister, Charles Talleyrand, said. Smelling blood, Britain, Prussia, Russia, and Sweden united against him. Only Austria, ruled by his wife's father, wavered. 